James Toseland. This multi-talented guy, he's recording his third album as we speak, became the youngest ever World Superbike champion in 2004 on a Ducati. He repeated that feat, winning the World Superbike Championship again, this time on a Honda in 2007. Shortly after, he moved to MotoGP for Tech 3 on a Yamaha alongside Colin Edwards. What was his best ever race? Take it away, James. Hey, Simon, and uh, everybody who's watching. Um, it's uh, an absolute honour to be talking through my favourite race. Uh, it took a little bit of time to, to think about it, actually, because uh, I was fortunate enough to have uh, uh, quite a few really memorable ones. I think I've got to take you back, though, to 2007 at uh, my home race at Brands Hatch uh, and my only ever double win uh, in, in World Superbike. I had some amazing races in, in MotoGP as well, with Valentino Rossi in Australia and obviously in Qatar being second on the grid in my first race and battling with Lorenzo, etc. Um, but the uh, it wasn't really about the, the, the individual race that brands at. It was the whole that made the difference. It was the whole environment and the atmosphere. There was 126,000 people um, attending that weekend, which... Brands actually is like an amphitheater. The audience is 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 higher than the track, and it, and and if you're in the grandstand, just at the end of the start and finish straight there, you can pretty much see the whole of the Indy track. Obviously, it goes into the woods, down to the fast part, which which you can't see. But uh, it's a it's an amazing amazing place to go and watch motorcycle racing or any motorsport. And I was fortunate enough in two thousand and seven to be going there leading the championship on the ten k Honda. Uh, I was having huge battles, really, it was just uh, mainly between me and Troy Bayliss. Uh, but uh, Biaggi was, was, was catching up quick uh, on the Suzuki. Uh, obviously, with uh, coming from, from Grand Prix racing to Superbikes, and he was getting used to that. And me and Troy had got a little bit of a head start on him, on, on the experience with the Pirelli tyres, etc. But I remember Troy uh, Bayliss uh, saying he's coming to the UK to, to spoil my party. I remember that in the press conference, so it was warming up quite nicely. On the rivalries, um, it had been such a hard year uh, of, of racing with Troy. Troy is one of the most tenacious um, competitors that you'll ever meet. And just uh, just in general, you can just tell his, 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 just his natural aura um, is, is someone not to be messed with. And, it, you know, it is people like Troy Bayliss, Colin Edwards, um, Pierre Francesco Keeley, uh, Ruben Zaus, Noriyuki Haga, Troy Corsa, Andrew Pitt, um, many, many more that, uh, uh, that, that, that come to mind um, that really taught me the, the skills of riding a superbike at that level. Because I was only 20 years old when I came to World Superbike for the first year with GSE Racing. Uh, with Neil Hodgson as my teammate. Neil had just won the British Superbike Championship in 2000. And then in 2001, I went with him, with the GSE team, with HM Plant Sponsorship, with the Orange Bikes for three years. Um, before, and that's where I learnt my skills. And when I first went there, you remember the amazing battles in 2001, 2002 with Edwards and Baileys. And they were, they were fast. And I remember at 20 years old, there was sometimes and on occasions where I thought that that was slightly out of my reach, that of my capabilities and my talents, but it's because I, I, I went there so early and so young, and I was given the time from the teams that I rode for with HM Plant and then the Factory Ducati team in the early days, that I was <clears throat> given the time to, to develop my, uh, my my riding skills to that level. But I mean, I think I, th I finished 13th in the first year of Superbikes, I think seventh in my second year, and then third in my third year and then I won in 2004 but if you finish 13th and then 7th usually you don't get another year <laughs> to be honest at that level and I must thank HM Plant and GSE Racing and Colin Wright and all the boys for seeing the potential there obviously I, I got age on my side but certainly to finish 13th and 7th in the two years um, it certainly needed a team to have that uh, um, that, uh, that 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 you know that time that they gave to me to develop and i thank them very much for that because uh, i did need some time to get to that level uh, like anybody does but um 
in these times, it doesn't seem like you <laughs> the youngsters don't seem to have um, that uh, that privilege or that uh, <clears throat> you know that space anymore. You know, it seems uh, uh, so cutthroat because so all the kids are coming through so fast now. But so that's where I learnt my skills. And then, I, I, like I say, 2004, winning the championship, and then five, finished fourth, and then second, finishing second behind Bayless on the Honda. And then I, in 2007, I wanted to go one better than second, and that was win the championship. And Brands Hatch was a really pivotal round because it, I knew if I did a, I had a really good weekend there, I was going to be leaving the championship with more than a 50-point lead with about three, four races left. And then I knew it was going to be mine to, to lose. Um... So, because of the championship lead that I had, me and my manager Roger Burnett, we had an idea to maybe just throw a bit more into the mix and maybe play the national anthem before the race even starts, after the warm-up. So, still in my leathers, we get a keyboard set up on the start and finish and I had to uh, <laughs> learn learn to play and sing the national anthem. Obviously, I knew the words to it, but uh, I had to learn on the piano. And So, uh, if there wasn't enough to think about that day on consolidating my championship lead and leaving that weekend definitely with one hand on the trophy uh, I, I think uh, I agreed a little bit too early to chuck all the other stuff on because when I think about it now it was crazy to to have done that in my leathers before going out because can you imagine if I'd have sang the, the national anthem and then crashed in both races <laughs> in front of 126,000 people oh, they would have definitely said you know he's why is he concentrating on playing his keyboard when he should be concentrating on riding his bike and oh, I, I, all these things were going around on the first on the first race on the on the grid. I was thinking just at least get one in the bank. <laughs> I can crash in the second race in front of all these pain, good, lovely people if I just at least get one good result for him in the bank. So I won the first race obviously with a double. So and then. The memorable one was the second one because it's one of the rare times in a race against that quality of field where I was in second or third and I knew I'd got it. And there's very, very, very few races as a professional racer at world level where you're riding around comfortable. <laughs> Usually you are panting out of your rear end, hanging on, trying to get your fishy line hooked onto somebody and um, <laughs> and chasing them down and, and holding your breath. But um, but this one I was really, really comfortable. And, and why this race was then so special, because I was able to relax. Um, um, I have my mum's just doing the washing in the background, by the way. Bit of a <laughs> bit of extra for you. Um, uh, was because I was so relaxed, I was able to hear the crowd and going around Druids the turn too, with the air horns and cheering and... Um, it, uh, I was able to take it in. I was that relaxed and that confident. I was able to take all of that in. And usually when you are so tunnel, with a tunnel vision going on and so focused on what you've got to do, you've got no chance of focusing on anything like that. And uh, so after I won the race and then ch chuck the leathers in the crowd and listen to your national anthem on the podium, which is still one of the most incredible emotions that unless you've, unless you've done that, it's very, very impossible to describe just how proud um, you are to hear your national anthem that you've been the best in the world at something and you've just pleased 126,000 people by doing it, which is a real bonus. And You know, when I saw Superbikes a couple of years after that, when unfortunately myself with the injury, I had to retire. And then through natural age with uh, BRG and Bayliss and Corsa and Hargrim, you know, they all retired literally within a couple of years. And it really did, it really did hurt Superbikes because at the end of the day, a show is all about the show people, isn't it? And um, without those guys there, the, the, the audience really didn't, it, it really did drop. And I was really shocked when I went to the races a few years later and, and you know, there, there were hardly anybody there really in comparison. And then that made me feel so, so fortunate um, to have been in Superbikes at that time against those amazing riders um, which then gave me the credit for what I was doing because people could reference what I was doing against those riders and have that atmosphere with so many people interested in it because I was I was the only British rider really at that time. Um, um, I don't think Chris uh, Walker was there that, that in 2007 then. I might be wrong, but I think I was the only British rider at Brands. So I'd got all that support just for me really as, as the home rider. And like I say... When I look back, very, very, very fortunate 
to have, uh, uh, have had all of that add to the amazing life and amazing career that I was able to have. And yes, so I hope that um, uh, gives you a bit of an insight of what my favourite race was. Uh, there's loads more obviously that I enjoyed. I had a massively uh, um, fun and enjoyable 12 year um, career. I had 20 years on motorcycles, but I was sadly uh, um, through injury, I had to stop in 2011. But uh, very, very grateful for everything that I've got in life from it. And I will always be a biker, I'll always be a bike fan. And uh, everybody keep enjoying the racing. I hope everybody stays safe from this awful virus. Everything's had to stop at the minute. Um, I'm really looking forward to the world starting back up again and and the world of motorcycle racing hopefully uh, can continue at some point but um, it's uh, you know we've got to think about uh, people's lives and there's more important things at the minute to think about and that's each other uh, to be good to each other and I think for for us as people and society I think we are really going to reassess and, and reevaluate things it's a really good time to kind of take stock at the minute and make changes um, and positive changes in his lives to coming out the other side of this in a better way and I'm sure we will. Um, I've got faith in humanity as much as uh, sometimes you, are, you can question it um, but I hope everybody stays away from this awful virus. If you've been affected by it um, I'm very very sorry and my thoughts go to you and your families and uh, hopefully we can you know get a, a vaccine as soon as possible and we can all get back to normal again but sending all my love Take care, everybody. Hope to see you on the road at some point, whether it would be my music with uh, with touring. Hopefully, I'll be doing the third album soon and recording that when everything calms down. Uh, that's what I'm looking forward to doing. And also, you know, maybe at the track, um, I'll be uh, obviously with uh, with Danny at Webb, um, helping him in the uh, the Weepold WRP uh, racing team in World Supersport, which was an amazing start uh, with a 12th position in, in Australia. Uh, very, very proud of him and the team for a brand new team. It was It was amazing. So hopefully we can continue that as well. But for now, thank you very much and all the very best.